you'll have your Bible open to Matthew chapter number 22 this evening. Matthew chapter number 22. We're going to be looking at something that I'm sure is quite familiar to you and uh, look at some other things along with it also. Uh, Matthew chapter 22, beginning with verse number 35. Uh, the Bible says, Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, how then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither does any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. How about that? Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the reading of the word of God this evening. And Lord, we thank you for this time that you allowed us to take to study some of the events and, and some of the things that you taught in that last week of ministry on the earth uh, before going to the cross, before the crucifixion, before the resurrection. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us to learn as we study, that we might learn more of you, that we might understand more of your word, that we could be equipped to, uh, to serve you better. And Lord, through it all, we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Yeah. Amen, thank you, you may be seated. Well, here in Matthew 22, we're continuing to kind of look at this on a day-by-day -day basis, what we call the Passion Week, uh, the week prior to uh, the crucifixion and then the resurrection of Jesus. It began on Sunday, and it's the Sunday we refer to as Palm Sunday. It's the time of the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. That began this week. And uh, here we have Tuesday, the third day, which we looked at last time on Sunday evening, the beginning of it. So we're seeing the third day continuing now on the Tuesday of the week. And this was a day of conflict. And so you'll see it's a day of conflict that, that continues. Uh, it begins with the chief priests and the elders questioning Jesus' authority. Uh, they came to him. They said, what, what gives you the authority uh, to teach and to preach uh, what you do? And you remember how that Jesus responded to them? He responded uh, with a question asking them to tell him, uh, where did John the Baptist get his authority? And you remember that, that they wouldn't give him an answer. They confided. They huddled up together. And they, and they talked amongst themselves and they said, you know, if we tell him that, that John's uh, message was from heaven, that his authority was from heaven, well, then he'll turn around and ask us, well, why didn't you believe him then? Or if we said that, well, John's message was made up, it came from man, then they said, we can't say that because all the people count John as a prophet. They'll pick up stones and they'll, they'll, they'll begin to stone us. And so they said to Jesus, we, we, we can't tell you. And Jesus, I think, had a wonderful response where he says, well, I'm not going to tell you anything neither. You're not going to tell me what you think about John the Baptist. There's no need for me to uh, have to try to depend, uh, de uh, uh, defend my authority before you. And then he begins to uh, speak in parables. And he gives three parables. Actually, we looked at the one parable uh, last time. But there are actually three parables uh, that are described in the scriptures. There's the parable of the two sons and then of the vineyard, which is the one that we studied, and then of the marriage feast. And uh, all of these apply to the nation of Israel and especially those leaders of Israel, the chief priests, the, uh, the scribes, the Pharisees. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 45, the Bible actually says, and when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. They said, you, they said, if we said it in our way of talking today, I guess we would say, he's talking about us. <laughs> he's, talk, he's talking about us. 
And, and Matthew 22, verse number 15, tells us that then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And so they understood these parables were directed uh, towards them. And, uh, and so now they're coming up with some other way of being able to bring him into some kind of conflict. They, they tried by questioning his authority. That didn't get them anywhere. And so they said, well, we're going to put some hypothetical situations before him. We're going to give him some questions and, and get him to answer it. And so there are three questions that they pose before him, questions concerning the tribute money, whether it was right to pay taxes to, uh, to, to Caesar, to Rome or not. And you remember how that Jesus answered them, said, well, bring me a penny. And, and, then, he, and then he took it and he asked them, now you tell me whose inscription, uh, who, whose face is engraved upon this penny? And they said, well, it's Caesar's. You remember his response? He said, well, then just give Caesar's what belongs to Caesar, but make sure you give God what belongs to God. Amen. And uh, so they didn't get anywhere with them with that question. And then the Sadducees came along uh, here in Matthew chapter uh, number uh, 22. It picks up in verse number 23 and tells us about the Sadducees. Now, let me remind you, you've probably already learned it uh, in your studies of the, of the New Testament and, and of the Gospels. There are two groups of religious leaders, two parties, really, you could call it that way, uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem and in Israel in that day. There were the Pharisees, there were the Sadducees. And, and so they were religious leaders, but they were two parties. They had different beliefs. The Pharisees believed in resurrection, and they also believed in miracles, and they believed in angels. The Sadducees did not believe in any of that. They did not believe in spirits or angels. They did not believe in miracles. They did not believe in resurrection. And so the Sadducees come to Jesus with a question about the, about the resurrection. Now, I mentioned there are two parties because understand, the ruling class of, of Israel that met in Jerusalem was called the Sanhedrin, which was made up of those two parties, Pharisees and Sadducees. Sadducees, dare I say, Republicans, Democrats. <laughs> that, that's kind of the picture you've got there. And so here you've got the Sadducees, and some people like to refer to them like this. They say that now the Pharisees, they believed in the resurrection. They believed in angels. They were fair, you see. And then the Sadducees, they didn't believe in miracles, angels, the resurrection. They were sad, you see. They just, they just didn't believe in anything any good. And so they come to Jesus with their question. And their question is about the resurrection. And they didn't believe in the resurrection. And so they pose him a hypothetical question. And you see it there uh, in those verses uh, where they said, well, if you look back there, verse 24, they said, Master Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, that is, he, he, he had no child, uh, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And, and so all these brothers died. And then it says, last of all, the woman died, which well, never had any, any children, and so, anyway, it says, therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall be she, uh, shall she be of the seven? For they all had her as, a, as their wife. And Jesus simply responds and tells them, you, you err, you do err, not knowing the scripture nor the power of God. He says, in the resurrection, it's different. In the resurrection, you're going to have a different body. In the resurrection, it's going to be a, a different life. He said, in the resurrection, verse 30, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Uh, and, and so he says the resurrection is different. You, you, don't even, you don't even understand this. You don't even know your scriptures. And so he deals with that question. And then you'll notice in verse 33 says the multitude heard this. Now the indication here is uh, all these questions that they're bringing before him, they're bringing it to him in that temple area where he's been teaching. And, and there's a multitude of people. There's, a, uh, there's just the citizens of the, of the community there. And, and so they're able to hear this. They hear the questions that's being posed. They hear how Jesus is responding. And it says in verse 33, when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. Uh, they were, they, it was catching their attention. Jesus really was, uh, uh, 
uh, was, was really defeating uh, those that were trying to question him. And they were amazed at this. And so it says in verse 34, but when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. And then we pick up with another question that they have, and that is the question about the great commandment, which is the greatest commandment of the law. You'll notice that in verse 35, they got one of their group that was a lawyer. They, they said, well, let's get the lawyer now. And let's ask him a question about, about the law. Now, they appear, as we say, to be openly asking these questions. And so they're asking him now a legal question about the Old Testament law. One of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him. He didn't want to know an answer, really. He wanted to uh, try to put Jesus to a test. They, they, they were calculating ways that, that, that maybe they could get him to slip up. And the people to hear, they think, well, he's not, he's not such, a great, uh, such a, a great prophet or Messiah, whatever, either one. But, uh, but anyway, Jesus will answer this. And their question, Master, which is the great commandment in the, in the law? Now think about this, the Jewish doctors of the law, such as someone like this uh, lawyer. And don't you imagine that the Pharisees picked out the best man they had uh, to try to confound uh, Jesus in this, with this question. The doctors of the law were really, they were always debating uh, over which of the commandments was the greatest. That was a problem that was going on in this day when Jesus uh, came to the earth. Uh, they would try to separate the commandments into uh, maybe, maybe heavy and light commandments. They would try to separate them as to what's, what's more important than, than the other. And uh, they would separate between the ritual and the moral. There were, those, there were laws that would be referred to as ritual laws of the Jewish religion and their practices. And then there were the great moral laws of God that would have to do with how you live your life, really every area of, of your life. Uh, and, and really, especially what the Ten Commandments is all about. And so they came to the conclusion, really, that the smallest, even the smallest detail of their ritual law, the, I mean, the, the, very, the very smallest thing of their ritual law, well, that, that was just right up there, uh, just as binding as all the moral laws of God were. They're really getting things mixed up in their thought and their understanding. Uh, they thought they could trap Jesus by, uh, by forcing him to take sides on a theological issue uh, like this. Well, Jesus responds. And he once again, as he did often, but he would, he would uh, appeal to the Old Testament scriptures. And he goes back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 5, a passage of scripture that they would have known. And, he, and it says there, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And so he goes back to the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 6. And, and, and he gives here what is known as the great commandment. He said there in verse number 38, this is the first and great commandment. The lawyer asked him the question, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And so where, where do you start? What's the great? What's the first commandment? He said it's this one. This commandment uh, that Moses uh, gave us back in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 5. And, and, and so Jesus responds in this way. The thing about it is, this is a great commandment. It really is. And it is the, it is the great principle for us to live by. In fact, the truth of the matter is, for, for, for those people in that day, for the Jews in that day, for us who are believers in the Lord today, uh, this is still the primary principle and the great commandment for us because what it is, it is the key to our being right with God. Amen. It's not the ritual laws that makes you right with God, but it's, but, it's, but, but it's carrying out this first and this great commandment that can make you right with God. It's the key to it. 
And so it involves some things, and, and we've studied this before. Let me just remind you of some things about it that it involves. For one thing, it involves having a great passion for God. A great passion for God. He said in verse 37, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. And notice how, how the commandment goes, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. There, there's, there, it involves a great passion here. You see, the problem with the Jews in this day, they knew the law, and they claimed to follow the law, to follow the commandment, but they really had no passion about God's law. They had no passion uh, concerning God's commandment. In Matthew chapter number 15, for instance, Matthew 15, Jesus said this uh, to those Pharisees uh, in verse 7. Matthew 15, verse 7, he said, Ye hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. For in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. You see, they took those traditions that they had come up with. They took those, uh, really, those wrong interpretations of, of the law of Moses and they adopted that uh, into a ritualistic uh, type of thing. And they made that greater than God's moral laws that dealt with our lives and the way that we would live our life, the key to making us uh, to be right with God. Understand this, uh, Christianity needs to be viewed as a relationship. Can you say amen to that? As a relationship, not just as a, as a religion. And the thing about it is, for a relationship to thrive and to survive, there must be a, ma a, a measure of passion. And I think we understand that. Uh, it, we, we understand that if we look at the marriage relationship, of course. But there must be a measure of passion. In, in other words, there must be a strong love involved. Can you say amen? A strong love. And that's the way it needs to be in our relationship with God. Jesus said, here's the commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, notice, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. What is that? That is a strong love, amen. There, there has to be some passion involved there. And see, Jesus said of those Pharisees, he said, you're just hypocrites. Uh, you say you're going to follow the law. You say you want to be obedient to the law. But I tell you what, God knows your heart and, and, and you confess me with your lips, but your heart is nowhere near. There's no passion. There's no real love. That's the kind of crowd that Jesus is talking to here. That's who's questioning him here. Uh, that's who he's dealing with here. That's who's bringing up all these questions. That's who's brought up all the accusations. And, and then finally, that's who's going to put him on the cross and put him to death. And so Jesus deals with them just straightforward and says, here's the first commandment. There, it involves a great passion. And we've got to have a great love for God. That's where it starts. And, and so you have to love God. Let me say this, uh, if I could tonight. Love God simply for who He is. Can you say amen to that? He said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Just love Him because He is the Lord. And love Him because He is your God. Amen. Love Him, the Lord. Uh, love the Lord, thy God. Just love Him for who He is. And then love Him for what He's done for you. And He's done so much uh, for us. In 1 John chapter number 4, 1 John chapter 4, I'll read a little bit beginning with verse number 7. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Uh, John writes and says, Beloved, let us love one another for love. And watch this, love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us. Here's what God did. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Here in His love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins, that atoning sacrifice for our sins, that one and only sacrifice that would satisfy the wrath of God against man's sin. And, and so that's what He's done for us. And as, as John would say in, in 1 John 4, verse number 19, we love Him because He first loved us. 
And so we ought to love God uh, because of, of who He is. Love the Lord thy God. But we should love God for what He has done for us. We love Him because He loved us. And He proved His love for us by sending His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to that old rugged cross. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God commendeth His love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Love Him for what He has done for us. Love God for who He is. Jesus says this great commandment. I tell you, it involves passion. And that was something that those Pharisees and those scribes, that's, that's what they were missing. Jesus said, you, 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 you speak of me, you speak of God, you, you worship God with your lips, but your heart is far removed. There needs to be passion involved, a strong love. And then there needs to be a great priority. Verse number 38, a great priority. He said, this is the first and great commandment. You realize what that means. If it's first, it means it's priority. Amen. If it's number one, it means first place. It means priority. He says this is the first and the great, pri uh, the great uh, uh, first and the great commandment. A great priority. Many people really just don't get anywhere spiritually simply because of that lack of priority. They don't make it a priority in their lives. There are those who have confessed faith in Christ, have been baptized, have joined a church uh, in their life, but yet still don't make it a, a priority to serve the Lord or make it a priority to be faithful to their church. I mean, it's, it's sad, but we see it all around us. We see it within our families. We see it in our neighborhoods. Uh, we, we know it with the people that we uh, may, maybe go to work with in the workplace. Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, but you know, I, I know I need to be going to church and just kind of got out of, the, out of the habit. Why are they out of the habit? Because they never got their priority right. It takes a great priority along with a great passion to, to fulfill this first and this great commandment. And uh, a, a priority, when you think about priority, there are two ways that you can really determine whether you've got your priority right or not. For one thing, priority uh, is, is determined by time. It's determined by the time you spend. And such as Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, where the Apostle Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed, listen, by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How do you give your body as a living sacrifice? It takes time to do that. How do you renew your mind? You renew it with the word of God. You renew it by serving God. How do you do that? That takes time. You have to spend time. Priority is really determined by the time that you spend. Not only that, but priority also is determined by the money that you spend. Not only the time that you spend, but the money that you spend. It's measured by finances. And Jesus made that clear in Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 19, when he said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through uh, nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Can we say it like this? There's where your priority is going to be. Your priority really is going to be revealed. It's going to be shown. It's going to be determined by, by what you spend more time on and by what you spend more money on. And so it takes a great priority, this great commandment. It involves a great passion. It involves a great priority. But it also involves a great purpose. Verse 39 and verse number 40. And the second is likened to it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then Jesus said on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. Uh, our purpose, think of it like this. Our purpose is really a reflection of our priority. And if our priority is to love and to worship and to serve God, then our purpose will be to love and to minister to and to witness to people. Can you say amen to that? 
to love your neighbor as yourself. If we have that priority right of loving God, then our purpose is going to be what should come behind that when we love our neighbor and, and we care for others. You see, we, let's understand this. The great commandment prefaces the great commission. We really uh, cannot carry out the great commission if we're not involving ourselves in the great commandment. We must have a love for each other. It's an evidence of being saved in John chapter number 13. John 13, verse 34 and verse 35, Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this, listen to this, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. We, we must have love for each other. It gives evidence that we're saved. But we also must have love for the lost. And I think one of the greatest examples of this is Jesus himself. Of course, uh, his great love is seen in his obedience to the Father and, and, and going to that cross and being nailed to that cross, and shedding his blood and dying as a sacrifice and, and the payment for, for man's sins. But we must have love for the lost. I think Jesus gives us a great example when the Bible speaks of him in Luke chapter 15 and verse 1 and 2, then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. The Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Why? You know, what they said about him was true. They said it as an accusation. They said it really in, in, in somewhat of a, of a mockery of him. But what they said about him was true. He does receive sinners. Dear friend, that's why he came to the earth. The Bible says that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to save sinners. Uh, he came to save you. He came to give you the opportunity to receive him. And by receiving him, have the promise of everlasting life, which you cannot have apart from him. He said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. No one knows God but by Jesus Christ. No one will ever see heaven but by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. No one will ever be able to miss hell. By the way, you'll never escape hell because once you're there, you're there to stay. But you can miss it. You can miss it by by trusting Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of your life. And to do that, you've got to believe His Word. And you've got to know that He died for you and proved His love for you. Uh, Jesus loved you. And that is proven there by the fact that He receives sinners. He'll, he'll, he receives sinners and still does today. And, and, and so there's a great purpose here in this great commandment. And Jesus personifies it himself in how he loves and how he died for and how that he'll save a lost sinner. And then, but look with me in verse 41 down through verse number 46. And let me show you something else. Remember, we're looking at this day of conflict as it continues and the questions that they've had for Jesus. They questioned his authority. They're trying to get him mixed up with throwing these other questions out and getting them to say something that they could catch him in, that they can trip him up, that they can point out to the people, say, hey, he's wrong on that, but they can't catch him in anything because he's not wrong on anything. Amen? He is truth, and he is life. He is the Son of God. He is God in the flesh. They'll never catch him uh, uh, on any, with anything wrong. And so down in verse 41, down through verse 46, Notice how it says, And while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them. Now he comes back with a question. I think it's kind of neat in here. Do you see how many times they, they pose these questions? He says, well, let me ask you something. And he comes back this time with another question. And again, just like that question about the authority of John the Baptist. Now they, they met together. They had a little, little council. They had a little powwow. And they huddled up. And they said, well, we just can't tell you. Uh, they, they knew what they thought about John the Baptist. They didn't believe him. But they said, we're, we're not going to tell you. We, we don't, uh, people could hear us. And, uh, but here, they have no answer at all. 
Look at this question now. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then called him Lord, how is he his son? Now look at verse 46. And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Can't you just picture them scratching their heads? Maybe putting their head down. One of them looking to the other one. Maybe shrugging their shoulders. And they walk off. And they see that, they're, that, that they can't get anywhere with this man. On another occasion, you remember they'd sent, uh, Herod had sent, I believe it was Herod that sent some of his uh, soldiers to them early on. And, and uh, they, they were supposed to, they were supposed to go capture, get them and bring them to them. They, they couldn't do it. They went back empty-handed, and, and when he asked them, said, what's, uh, what's wrong? Why, why didn't you get them? They said, never a man spake like this. He said, we have never heard anybody that could talk like this. With the, with the doctrine, with the authority, with the accuracy, with the truthfulness, with the faithfulness to the Old Testament Scriptures, to the law of God. They said, we've, we've never heard anybody that's able to, to talk like this. And so they have no answer for him here. And it is maybe a puzzling question. Had Jesus asked them a question uh, that they're not able to answer. And what he's doing, he's referring to Psalm 110. Psalm 110 and verse 1. Where David calls him Lord, which, which actually means... By the terminology of the words, it means that he's God. David calls him Lord or that, or that he is God. And so in verse uh, 43, as, as you just saw, it, it states that David wrote by inspiration of the Spirit of God. Uh, Jesus said, how then doth David in spirit? Do you see that? He made, 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 made the point here. It's the Spirit of God that speaking through David. The Pharisees would have to say, yeah, we understand that. Uh, but David in spirit. Uh, calls him Lord. So he states that David wrote by inspiration the Spirit of God and that he wrote concerning Christ, the Christ that, the, that would come to Israel. He spoke concerning the Christ as the son of David. And, and that's what those Pharisees would have called it. That's what they referred to, uh, how they would refer to it. His question was that if David then would call him Lord, meaning God, if David would call uh, Christ God, then how can he be David's son? Well, what a question. Can you answer it? <laughs> if David called him God, how do they call him David's son? Well, there is an answer. And, 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 and you have it right there in your hands. It's right there in your Bible. Uh, the answer is, is Matthew chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 2, the account of the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That's how David could call him God and how that they would call him David's son. As the eternal God, he is David's Lord, but he is also the God-man. He is God incarnate. He is God in the flesh. And so as the God man, as God in the flesh, by way of the virgin birth, amen, as God in the flesh, he is David's son. There's the answer. If the Pharisees, now watch this, if they had answered the question correctly, and, and I guarantee you, they knew Psalm 110 verse 1. They knew the prophets had prophesied that, that a virgin would conceive and would bear a child. Uh, they knew what Isaiah said there in Isaiah chapter number 9. They knew the Old Testament prophets. They, they, they knew this. 
But the if the Pharisees had answered this question correctly, they then would have had to have acknowledged that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. That the Messiah had come. That the Son of David had come. That the Son of God had come. But in their hardness of heart, you know what they did? They rejected the truth that was standing right in front of their eyes. They just rejected the truth. As we said, John chapter 1, verse 11, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. And that's really the condemnation to the Jews or the Jewish nation. God sent his son. He sent the one that was prophesied of. He sent the Savior. He sent their Messiah. Their, their Messiah has already come. Orthodox Jews today are still looking for the Messiah. The Messiah's already come. His name was Jesus, and he proved himself to be God's Messiah, God's Savior of the world. He proved himself to be God's Son, but yet they rejected him. They turned away from him. They questioned him. They mocked him. They ridiculed him. They tried to catch him. They tried to be sneaky and conniving and do all that they could do to trip him up. Finally, he just asked them a question and they just kind of shrugged their shoulders and have to walk away. And do you notice how the text said they didn't ask him anything else? Here on out, until they get to the trial, they're, they're not, they don't ask him anything else. And so truth was standing right there before their eyes and yet they rejected him. And so here's a question that I would pose to, uh, to us and, and to people still today. And we mentioned this Sunday evening as well. We talk about the Jews rejecting Christ. And we've seen what God did. God sent his prophets. They killed the prophets. That parable of the vineyard. God finally sent his son. They killed his son. It's what the Jews did. Rejected him altogether. And then the question we would pose is, uh, again is this, what will you do? What, what, what are you going to do? Truth stands right before you, dear friend. Truth can be found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Truth is only found in the gospel of Jesus, in his coming to this earth, his death on the cross, and his resurrection from the grave. And so God has given us a gospel He's given us a message. He's given us the message of grace that if you will just simply believe what he did for you and trust him, all your sins can be forgiven and you can have the promise of everlasting life. I don't know about you, but I don't know of a greater, a greater message, a greater gospel, a greater, a, greater, a greater opportunity that anyone can have than that of trusting and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and being saved. Amen? Amen? And so if I could say to someone that may catch this message online, dear friend, if you don't know that you've ever been saved, Jesus has come. We have the account in the gospel. We have it in the Bible, in the word of God. It, it's, not, it's not hard for you to find. You can, you, you can get yourself a Bible. You can find a Christian friend. You can go see a, a pastor. Uh, you can talk to a Christian man that works, works with you on your job or a, a, a friend that is in your school and, and, you, and you know that they confess to having been saved. You can find the answer. You can find the truth. There, there, it's, it's not hid from us in America here today. You, you can find it. You can know it. And you can uh, trust it and be saved and have the promise of everlasting life. Our prayer at Grace Baptist Church is that, that you'll do just that before it gets too late. Let's stand together, church, our heads bowed and our eyes closed for prayer. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much once again for the word of God. Thank you for the truth that we have in our wonderful Savior, the Lord Jesus. Thank you for the truth of the gospel. And Lord, we do pray that you'll speak to hearts in this world today that 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 they would come to know the truth and come to trust Christ 
and be saved and have the promise of everlasting life. To miss hell and to have the gift of eternity in heaven. And Lord, we'll just thank you and praise you for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's sing together once again, church, as Brother Tim leads us. 183.